last open meeting of the year, everyone. I'm so glad that you could join us. Um, I'm just going to spend um, a few minutes just going through the introduction um, and the program for tonight. Um, so we'll start uh, with the introduction, which is currently happening, and a few announcements. Um, and uh, we'll um, introduce our uh, first two speakers, Sean and Emma, who would do um, a little bit of a um, talk, followed by a Q&A with um, both speakers, after which we'll go into a breakout room for a quick 15 minute discussion. And after the breakout room, we will be um, hearing from Alex and Nessie from the CEE Bill Alliance. Um, after which we will be presenting one of our campaigns um, from the Embodied Carbon Group for a quick presentation and discussion, uh, followed by a panel discussion with all of our speakers and then, of course, the last Bishop's Arm session for the year. Um, so welcome to all those who haven't been to an ACAN meeting before. Um, so we'll go through a quick introduction of ACAN for those who aren't as familiar um, with who we are. We are a volunteer network of individuals in the built environment industry. Our manifesto has three overarching aims. The first one is decarbonizing now. Uh, we're trying to push for more ambitious regulation that we urgently need to decarbonize. The second being ecological regeneration. So recognizing that more is needed than reaching net zero. We've got a bigger crisis of the ecological breakdown happening as well as climate change. Um, and ultimately we want to have a net positive impact on biodiversity and the natural environment. And the third being cultural transformation. So bringing agency back to the architect, encouraging a more collaborative um, environment and inspiring workplace activism um, creating change in our everyday jobs. Um, ACAN, uh, we operate in a, a few thematic groups and within these groups we run campaigns. Um, and you can see the thematic groups listed on the left. Um, the types of actions that we um, undertake as a group, um, this happens both as a organization wide level and within campaigns. And today our focus will be particularly on political campaigning and lobbying. And the reason why we think um, campaigning and lobbying is so important is because of what we believe the role of the architect should be. Throughout history, architecture has never been divorced from politics. Buildings, infrastructure and public spaces have always been used to denote power, colonialism, gentrification, globalization, but also community resistance and progress. Architecture is inherently political and architects play an active role in building the systems that make up our cities. And we certainly can't ignore what's happening in politics at the moment. Current le legislation does not go far enough. And a recent example of this was the permitted developments rights and the planning reform just of last month. These proposed uh, reform to the planning system neglects the 2050 targets for carbon neutrality. There is a drive to build, 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 no enforceable targets to environmental goals and does not currently acknowledge the inadequate building regulations. This really highlights the need to engage with policymakers. Changing legislation is key to um, tackling, the, tackling the climate crisis and bringing about the scale of change that we need. The power of grassroots movement is to bring together individuals in a concerted effort for change. Us as a group, we can represent the industry as a whole. Naomi Klein describes climate change as a collective problem that requires collective thinking. It's up to us to imagine what an alternative future could be. Opportunity to harness this collective energy can influence politics and put climate, the climate emergency at the forefront of the agenda. We also really need to collaborate with those whose vision we share. So far as a one year old organization, we've attempted to engage with um, the government through several of our campaigns and a large number of our campaigns uh, are dealing with public consultation. So for example, we've done the safe, safe structural timber, permitted development rights, England tree strategy, future home standards and planning for the future. We aim to look for ways to maximize impact on these campaigns. The reality is that we've got nine years left to reach net zero and it's really crucial to push these agendas higher up the parliamentary agenda. 
Today, we're really excited to welcome speakers who are campaigners, activists, policymakers, and grassroots leaders. And I'm, we're really keen to learn how we can effectively channel this campaign energy to lobby for the change that we urgently need. Before we get to the speakers, um, I'm going to hand over to a couple of our coordinators for some announcements. So first, I'll pass to Ben Yates from the Education Group. Thanks, Eve. So yeah, I'm just going to talk about the next education campaign, uh, which is the Students Can campaign. And um, we're seeking to build on the success of our our last campaign, the Climate Curriculum campaign, where we managed to increase awareness of the inadequacies of architectural education, education in its current form and the necessity of climate literacy. Uh, we're now seeking to give students the confidence to act when they're not taught environmentally sustainable skill sets by their tutors to push, push for change, change at a grassroots level. Uh, next slide, please, Eve. Since the end of the summer, we carried out a student survey where we found that the majority of students believe that their tutors are not responding to the urgency of the situation. And furthermore, uh, next slide, please. We found that even more students are unaware of any climate action groups or safe spaces to voice their concerns and act, act collectively on these educational inadequacies. So this campaign, Students Can, is an effort to unite students to encourage them to take action by setting up their own action networks in their respective universities, showing that working to alleviate the climate emergency with your peers is one of the best ways to alleviate those inevitable feelings of isolation that are, uh, we're all feeling at present. Uh, we've been holding workshops, uh, galvanizing student groups alongside the wonderful Scott McCauley, and we've seen rise to a number of action, new action groups already with more in the works. Uh, we will also be starting an ACAN student network, uh, connecting the dots between universities across the UK and in the long term, we hope bridging over to the RBA. And uh, if you are keen to start an action group of your own, uh, next slide, please, Eve. Please get in touch with us. Uh, so, yeah, education at architectscan.org uh, with the subject students can, uh, so we can set up, a, set up an introductory meeting and get you guys started. Um, so yeah, if there's any students listening, take heed, get in touch. Uh, we're planning to launch this campaign in, uh, in full online and hopefully by that point we'll have a new student portal ready uh, in the new year. Uh, so yeah, watch this space. Uh, now over to Alistair. Brilliant, thanks very much Ben. That dovetails nicely with professional standards. I'm going to try and keep this short but it's a, a bit of a big topic so we'll see how we get on. Um, as Eve mentioned, really one of ACAN's sort of founding principles is um, to, to define a sort of a new kind of professionalism, and that's what the Professional Standards Group is all about. Here's our, here's our mandate. Our first major action was the Free Tom Bennett campaign when we went to the ARB, the Architects Registration Board, um, and handed in a letter sort of upholding Tom's integrity and suggesting that it was, it was right what he did um, in being arrested for the protests. Um, that meant that actually we, we had a really useful meeting with the ARB. So next slide, please, Eve. Um, myself and Tom and, and Julia Barfield had the opportunity to speak to the ARB about what, what could change and how to actually improve professionalism across our, across our industry and the letter that you can't quite read there outlined sort of four or five points that we wanted to, the ARB to, to make some changes for. We were looking for them to update standard two of their code around knowledge and skills, standard five of the code around um, taking care of the environment, um, to update the educational criteria and also to declare a climate emergency and recognize that some architects have an increased responsibility. Um, as is often the case with these things, it went quiet for quite a while, but then in April we, hear, we heard actually that architects' competence were likely to be tested in more detail in the future. This was partly a result of um, Dame Hackett's review into building safety and partly as a result of climate. Um, and then the good news came in December uh, this year, well, just, just recently when all 42,000 members um, of the ARB received the Climate Change and Sustainability Strategic Statement. So I'm going to show you a few highlights from that. Next slide, please, Eve. Um, happily, they suggest that architects have a significant role in, to play in addressing the, these challenges um, and that through robust sustainable practice, architects are in a position to reduce the effects of climate change in the built environment by conserving natural resources, designing for adaptation and mitigation and minimizing 
carbon emissions. Um, they also recognize that the high level wording of the code needs expansion in order to provide sufficient guidance to architects on how to approach the challenges of the climate emergency. Um, and given the long term effects of design decisions, architects should aspire to do more than just comply with current legislation and the codes. So they are actually taking quite a strong line here. Um, next slide, please, Eve. Um, so the four recommendations and the, the activities that are ongoing, we're, we're generally supportive of and do line up with, with our requests. Um, and they've recognized that actually this, whilst this long, whilst this competence review is a slow outcome, is a slow process, they will actually um, issue an interim guidance note in the meantime. So they say, we're taking interim measures to make a clear statement on the importance of competence in this area. Um, we've actually had sight of that guidance note and are really happy with the kind of the level of detail and the extent and the scope of it. Um, so while this is a slow review generally, it's actually quite good news that there is some, some positive things coming out of it. Um, so I suppose so the outcomes to conclude are that they're hoping that there'll be improved public confidence in architects' competence and commitment to carry out their work in a way that promotes sustainability and reduces the impact of their work on the environment. Um, and also greater clarity for the profession, students and schools of architecture on the skills, knowledge, experience and behaviours expected of architects in respect of sustainable design. So that's, um, yeah, hopefully you've all seen that if you're an architect and uh, if you haven't, make sure you um, go and mention it to your bosses or anybody else who might now be paying more attention to this because it, it really does build on their code and make it stronger while they update the code. Uh, next slide, please, Eve. So the next consultation that professional standards are hoping to tackle alongside education who've helped us on the, the previous campaigns um, will be the amendment to the Architects Act from 97. Um, these proposed amendments do reflect um, a lot of the issues going on with Brexit and freedom of movement and the changes to professional recognition. Um, and also, as I mentioned, Dame Judith Hackett's building safety bill. Um, but this is an opportunity actually to to make sure climate is front and centre here and they've also suggested in the outcomes at the bottom of this review that they are expecting climate literacy to improve. Um, so it'll be how we're tested, how we're examined and how we're regularly retested as architects. Um, so yeah there's a lot of questions to answer in this review but if you're interested in joining professional standards and helping us with this it's due on the 22nd of January so there's a little bit of time to, to get to it. Um, the good news is that recently Mina Hasman who some of you might know has joined me as a coordinator in professional standards, so we've got a bit more resource to, uh, to get it done. Um, so yeah, that's me on professional standards. I think I'm handing over to Joe G now. Thanks, Alistair, and well done. Really good work over the past year on that. Hello, everyone. My name is Joe Giddings, and I'm one of the ACAN coordinators, and I will be chairing the discussion from here on out. So the theme of this event is politics and how we engage with it. Alas, architects have largely ignored the world of politics, with a capital P, that creates the rules that really shape, constrain and guide what kind of buildings we build and how we build them. Until now, there's been a distinct lack of engagement from architects in the political sphere. But along with climate movements from all walks of life, we at ACAM have recognised that to really change really affect change we need to affect politics policy regulation taxes and that means engaging our politicians and policy makers in conversation and lobbying whatever that means so this evening we are going to hear from voices that are working to shape our cities not through drawing but with dialogue motions and campaigns so we'll hear from our first two speakers then have a quick q a so please add your questions in the chat box as they go along. First up, we've got Shan Berry. Shan is a woman with many hats on. She's the co-leader of the Green Party of England and Wales, along with Jonathan Bartley. She's a London Assembly member, where she holds the Mayor of London to account on important issues that affect the capital. She's also a councillor rem representing the Highgate Ward in Camden, and she is the Green candidate in the upcoming London mayoral elections. But besides all these titles, she is also an activist at heart. She first gained experience of significant campaign success in 2007 by lobbying the Mayor of London to introduce a higher congestion charge for more polluting vehicles, something that we're all thankful for today. And more recently, Shan was part of the drive to get whole life carbon assessments introduced into policy at the GLA in her capacity as a London Assembly member, I think. Uh, so I'll pass over to Shan now. 
Great. Hello. <laughs> Thanks. It's so great to see how many people are in this meeting, because if this was a real life meeting, this would be a giant room full. Um, I love the fact that we could do these online and, and all get together. Um, I know there's people from all over the country in, in the in the chat saying hello. So that's great. And yeah, just really nice to be here. Um, <laughs> Joe's run through quite a few of the jobs that I have. And it's true. I have I have quite a few political hats on now and I focus a lot of my work on um, policies and holding other politicians to account but yeah my earlier jobs uh, were as a campaigner I worked for a long time as uh, a road campaigner um, trying to support people across the country doing campaigning I've done lots of different campaigns the 4x4 campaign was one I'll talk about something I, I did on uh, boiler scrappage really quite freelance as well as one of my examples so I'm really pleased that this meeting is about what tactics to use, what, what goals to set, what strategies, because that's really what I like to talk about. And, and getting the right strategy can mean you win something really quickly. Um, so, so I hope we can all plan and do that today. Um, we're here to talk about climate action um, and, and climate politics. And I think we've got a real issue with climate change because it's it's such a big problem. It's going to affect everybody's futures. It's so, so urgent. It can seem like too big and too urgent and people can feel a bit disempowered but I think beyond getting the right targets set and obviously I spend a lot of time in the last couple of years shouting out 2030 not 2050 and we've you know we've managed at last you know we've pushed this via really good campaigning at a local level via climate emergency declarations in councils we've managed to push that 2030 urgent target that comes out of the special report from the IPCC two years ago now two and a bit years ago from that two year starting point we've now got the government saying its targets need to be 2030 we've had today the committee on climate change telling us how to do this so we're making progress and it is that whole process of going from setting the right targets to then finding the right plans to back it up and that means thinking about targets and rules and and limits and and methods and all of those things across so many different areas of our lives because we've really got to decarbonize absolutely everything um, as far as we possibly can to avoid tipping into runaway climate change so it's great to be addressing a group of people who can make such a big difference to such an important part of our, of our upcoming carbon footprint because embodied carbon um, is one of the big gaps that there were in policy. Everybody just talked about like operational carbon for such a long time with, you know, with vehicles, with, with everything. Um, and it just wasn't there. Um, and what I like to call stuff turnover, the use of resources in our economy wasn't talked about. And it's, and it's coming now, it's really coming. And when you look at the stuff that we produce, the waste that we produce um, across the country and in London, construction waste is such a huge part of that obviously by ton and it's heavy waste and that's part of it but it's still just like way too much we're demolishing far too many buildings we're not reusing and recycling and all of those other principles that we use in our kitchens when we do buildings so yeah it's great that you're all working on this and this is an area of policy that i think is moving really quickly because i I was elected to the London Assembly in 2016 with this as one of my goals, get more attention paid to embodied carbon. Um, and then it was really, it was really hard to talk about. We didn't have a strong um, theoretical basis. Um, you know, I would, I would sit there going, we've got 10 years left. We can't blow our entire carbon budget on building greener things. We have to try and minimize the amount of carbon we use doing the building in the first place. Um, and people were like looking at me strange and going, but there's zero carbon building, Sean. What do you mean? So it's great that this is, this has moved on since then. And I've been going through today the, the timeline of, of all the things we've done in the in the London Assembly and towards the London plans since 2016 and you can see the 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 progress that was absolutely made I first wrote about it in September 2016 just as after I was elected um, and then we got the first London plan um, which planning document for the whole of London didn't mention it and then we started to talk about it more and then um, the RICS um, fantastic what's he called uh, Simon Sturgis wrote some guidance so it gave me some stuff to show to the mayor's team and then in the next draft of the London plan it came forwards then my colleague Caroline Russell took it up in the environment committee in the assembly and brought Simon and the team in to, to talk about it wrote to the mayor again and then and we've ended up in the final London plan with a 
a solid policy, more or less what we asked for at the beginning. And now we've got, um, I'm going to wave a document at you, which is not the best thing to do on Zoom. But we've got now got this guidance coming out, the whole life cycle carbon assessments guidance, which is planning guidance that goes with the London, London plan policy. And the little gap I was still pointing out at this point was um, essentially that although you're measuring the carbon of what you're doing, you're not comparing it with the other options, the retrofit options that might be lower carbon. And now that's in there. There's actually, it does say in stage one, make sure you look at retrofit and compare it. So we're really, you know, it's, it's, it's motoring, but this, and that's the worst metaphor for a green tea, sorry. It's moving very fast. It's flying. No, that's even worse. Um, but it's, it's definitely moving fast. But this is, this is the London plan. And there's a lot to do in the national level with, with building regulations. And then the London plan only applies strictly to very big projects we've got to get that brought down into all the local council policies um yeah there's so much to do to fix these levers and cogs and and targets and rules for this area so i'm so glad you're you're all working on it um that's absolutely fantastic um and it is it is catching on the the i don't know if you this is in a different area but where i used to work which is roads policy the lower thames crossing which is this gigantic new road that's going to go uh, across from Essex to Kent. Um, the planning inspector for that basically sent it away for more work and they've had to withdraw the planning application just a, a week or two ago because of the embodied carbon that would in, be involved in building that giant road. So that's, it's, it's genuinely starting. So yeah, we're going to talk in the air breakout rooms about tactics. Um, and I think, yes, we have to be um, strategic about trying to fix the, the the rules that's that's what i always try and focus on it's no use letting the rules sit where they are and playing whack-a-mole with bad things like like i used to do with the road campaigns i was always always trying to fix the rules the way that roads are assessed the way that money is given out because that stops you having to keep doing the fighting on each individual basis um so i think that's that's really important but you do need these rules at every single level and you can use tactics towards councils you can use local areas um to raise things like we did with the climate emergency motions that then filter upwards you can do lots of grassroots things and I think one of the most powerful things I've learned as a campaigner is the power of teaming up the public, the, the public opinion, people who care about these things, people affected on the ground, um, like we did in London, the people who are affected by a state demolition were a powerful voice asking for um, embodied carbon to be taken into account because they knew not only was their social uh, impacts of demolishing estates there were also carbon impacts and it's to do with the fact that greens were involved in some of the campaigns but that came up and so you've got people on the ground saying they want this and if you add to that the professionals the people who are working in the area um who are doing the work who want to change things that's a really powerful combination and that's how we won um in, back in 2009 um we won a good demonstration project for how a Green New Deal could work in a boiler scrappage scheme. And we did that by teaming up um, people like me, people like Friends of the Earth, um, people like um, the professional bodies um, for like the gas and heating industry, um, along with grassroots small businesses, plumbers, plumbers, merchants. And this unlikely allies combination went and pestered the Chancellor of the Exchequer at the time, um, who was Alison Darling, I believe. And said we need a boiler scrappage scheme for multiple reasons and and he did that um, and it was a great scheme cut carbon improved boilers um, and kept some small businesses going um, and all of those things so that kind of combination of people getting together and asking can, can shift things quite quickly and i think you should definitely be thinking about not only how you mobilize architects but how you get some some grassroots people affected by this involved and that's and I think that's that's probably enough for me to say right now. Honestly, I could give you a big seminar on campaigning tactics, but that's um, yeah. That I'm really looking forward to, to to carrying on working with you basically and hearing more later on today. Thank you so much, Shen. And um, yeah, I totally agree. It's really important that we shift the focus onto embodied carbon now. And fascinating to hear about your work behind the scenes at the GLA. So before we take any questions, we're going to go straight into our next speaker, Emma Dent Code who's been a Labour councillor in Kensington since 2006, but she's also written for architectural publications throughout her career. So she bridges the divide. From 
17 to 19, Emma represented Kensington in Parliament. She was elected in the SNAP election on June the 9th, 2017. And four days later, on June the 14th, the most terrible tragedy occurred within her constituency as the Grenfell Tower was engulfed into flames. And the truth behind this tragedy is continuing to unfold every day. And there's some really horrible uh, injustices and, and negligence being uncovered by the um, inquiry. Um, Emma's known, however, for, for working really hard tire tirelessly on the behalf of her constituents. Whilst in Parliament, she was in a number of all party parliamentary groups. And um, she's also, similar to Shan, um, an activist at heart. In 2018, she was quoted in the Architects Journal saying, I try to be polite, but I'm an activist and always have been. I ch I've got a chain and padlock at home waiting in my hallway, which is great to hear. So I'll pass over to Emma now. Thank you very much. Thanks for that. And it was very good to um, to, to hear Sean and her, all her tips and so on. Um, yeah, I want to talk about, I'm going to start off with some anecdotal stuff about, about Kensington and Chelsea Council and how they do things and the kind of things we had to look out for when we're campaigning, really. Um, I remember many years ago, um, the, the council decided that they were going to uh, reduce their carbon footprint because they have to pay a fine every year. Um, to the, oh, who would that be? I can't remember which, but they have to pay a fine every year because they use too much. So they decided to put solar panels on the roof and they did this big thing, a huge, a big publicity campaign. Brilliant, they switched them on and they're going to oh, save money. So I kept on, I said, well, where, where have the um, panels come from? And they, you know, they were very, a bit shady about it. And I kept on asking and it took me about three months to get a response. So the solar panels, which were going to reduce their carbon footprint, had come from China. Of course they had. Of course they come from China. Absolute rubbish. Um, how can you say that you're reducing your carbon footprint with solar panels from China? Doesn't make sense. Um, so that was one of many things. <coughs> we're um, in the middle of numerous campaigns at the moment. We've got this one battle that we're in the middle of where um, a 10 year old master plan for developing an estate, it's a um, housing association or a council estate because they've stopped all that regeneration for now of uh, council estates, thank God. Um, this is a catalyst estate and they, they set up this master plan 10 years ago um, and by the time they actually build it, it will probably be another five years time. So 15 year old master plan, which involves the felling of 42 mature and very well loved trees. Um, and this is driving everybody mad. I mean, a lot of people don't get the planning side of it. They want to save trees, which is fine. And I would be the first to check myself to a tree. But the master plan has not been revised at all in all those years. And I said, well, this is an old plan. The world has changed. We have a climate catastrophe. We're going to be living post COVID. We've got a, a housing a disaster and so on and so forth. How are people um, going to live with, with whatever you're proposing here, which will be a 15 year old um, master plan? Um, and they're just not getting it and we'll see what happens there. But it's, a, it's the trees that, that people care about and actually they need to revisit this. And the planning system, which is ponderously slow, is not up to date with it. Now I sit on planning and just one more example I'm gonna give you here of, um, of what um, Sean was talking about actually, which is the whole life uh, carbon assessments. Um, and I was sitting on a planning committee a couple of weeks back and there's a building in Kings Road, Chelsea, which um, somebody wants to knock down and rebuild. And they go, it's zero carbon, it's zero carbon. Um, and uh, well, there were lots of things that weren't zero carbon more than anything else because they're knocking down a building and rebuilding it. But the block behind it, they said the residents that has said that it was specifically designed to take in as much light and sun as possible to reduce their, their own um, energy bills. Um, and when the block was going to be built, they'd actually have to fit more lights and more heating and so on. So this was a kind of double, double whammy, really, um, for carbon. The fact that, um, <laughs> that they were going to be, you know, well, they were screwed on both sides, basically. Um, but there is nothing in planning policy which will deal with it. And we have to look at these things. Um, I'm having a little bit of a battle 
at the moment about electric cars or council is, you know, they have a huge PR department. They spend more on that than anything else. I think everybody should have an electric car and plug it into a lamppost somewhere. And, you know, number one, they're very expensive and there's no real secondhand um, market for them yet um that you know and so it's it's really for rich people and um, we're subsidizing them rich and i do think the electric cars are selling now which depend on lithium lithium mining it's an awful awful toxic um process which is despoiling vast uh, virgin forests and landscapes all over the world um you know i do think we have to hang on a bit and wait the new generations of batteries and so on coming out let's just hang on a bit i don't want people using polluting cars, but if everybody who can afford it invests in these um, cars based on with uh, lithium batteries, we're, we're despoiling something else while we're making our air a little bit cleaner over here. And it's, um, it's I do think a lot of it is tokenistic, I'm afraid. So um, yeah, we've also got massive battles about cycling. And I honestly think if anybody who lives in London who reads um, the Evening Standard will think that, um, the council are anti-cycling and like they put in a cycling lane which is dangerous <laughs> um, um and uh, so we said we want a cycle lane labor group we want a cycle lane but it has to be a safe cycle lane um so we're having a bit of battle about that with the mayor of london as well who wants his money back because they're going to take it out before it's even been trialed properly so there's a huge battle going on there safe cycling absolutely essential um but it has to be done right um I, I was watching the uh, Grenfell Inquiry yet again, yet again today. When I can bear it, I watch it. Oh my God, anybody who's been following it in the press or watches it periodically, it's the, <laughs> it's the corruption which is at every level, not just financial, but the corruption of the people who are actually running these businesses, which is horrific. They're just the contempt they have for people who are going to live in these buildings while they're they're fixing the, you know, the um, the fire tests and so on. Um, today, the barrister said, "Oh, so we're looking at science perverted for financial gain, are we?" And I thought, "Oh my goodness, um, he really, he really nailed it." So that was um, that was quite something. But while I'm watching that, I'm thinking, you know, what, you know, we've got over three million people living in dangerous properties with dangerous cladding on. What and I know that they often they take it down, they don't know what to put up. What are we doing? What are we doing? Who is actually supporting new businesses who are developing new systems of insulation for these for these naked cold buildings, cold damp buildings? Um, or ones where they have the, they still have this dangerous cladding and people are, are terrified because people people contact me from all over the country um, um and talking about their, their cases. And I just think you know, are we actually investing in that? I don't think we are. Um, and we don't have the workers to do, we don't have the skills. Uh, are, are, we, are, we build, are we building here? Are we just gonna set up manufacture here? Um, and the whole issue of retrofit, do we have a whole industry? Why we should be investing in the whole industry of, of retrofit and the uh, skilled workers who need it. Behind all that, <laughs> behind all that, there is in parliament a massive lack of expertise. So when I was in Parliament, I was one of the few people who actually understood how buildings are made. Because, you know, I'm a historian, not an architect, but um, I do know how buildings are made. And I, I met one of the architects who, who worked on Grenfell Tower and people who work with Goldfinger. And I do know about, about those generations of buildings and how solid they are. They don't mess with them. But there's a huge lack of expertise. The only two other people I met in Parliament who understood buildings were both former firefighters, they're MPs, former firefighters who get it. Um, so that getting the message through, if we're lobbying, once we're getting all these, these campaigns going, getting the message through is the problem because most people don't understand how it works. And you talk to many of the Tory MPs about buildings and they talk about beauty and, ugh, you know, it was to be neoclassical and, and they have, they just don't have a clue how safe buildings should be made. So this is what I'm asking for anybody please, who is going to set up a campaign and lobby, whether it's your council, whether it's assembly members, whether it's MPs or anybody at any other level. Know your information, know it inside out, 
get that information, get a really, really good summary and top lines, as we say, you've got like 10 lines, fact, 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 that people can take in. Get a good summary so that when somebody who's insanely busy looks at it, they go, oh God, this is good. And then they maybe read, read more. If you come along with a big block of text, anybody who's insanely busy will think, oh, I'll read that tomorrow. And then they won't. Just bear in mind how busy people are and, and bring that information to them in a very, very easily digestible form. But the facts are hugely powerful. The facts and, and the kind of passion that, that all of you will bring to your campaigns. And um, that's, that's always my, my combination is um, statistics plus outrage, and, but you need the facts as well as the passion behind it. Um, yeah, so um, any kind of actions and so on, people think, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna do action, direct action, I've been involved in countless over the years. If you're going to do that, make sure it's purposeful while you're doing this, while you're, whatever it may be, training yourself to something, make sure you're doing something else as well, which is purposeful to push your policy through so that you have a, a proper route map. And every now and then you think people are bored, you can do a direct action to, to bring it into the, into the um, public eye again, but make sure, push it, just push your, 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 push your, um, your demands, don't say asks, don't ask, demand, push your demands, while you're continually bringing it into the public eye. Um, and um, find your allies. You will have allies, you'll have shams, you'll have people like me, you'll find a few allies, you'll find the firefighters or whoever it may be who cares about, about buildings um, and, and work with them, um, whatever party they're from, work with them. Um, but I think I, for me personally, it should always be fact-based. And bring your facts, as I say, to people in a digestible form and keep on hammering it because people forget uh, politicians are ridiculously busy. They have 101 things on their desk every day um, and you have to make it matter to them because it's not just about insulation. It's about people who died. It's not just about insulation. It's people who are freezing to death with mouldy. Um, I just had about five bits of casework today with the most appalling mould shocking mold um and we have to make it matter so um yeah i think i'm going to leave that there statistics plus outrage and bring the information to people in a digestible form thank you thank you so much emma statistics and outrage that's going to stick in the mind definitely um okay so there's there's a question that's come in that i think is quite pertinent um and it's a question that one of our coordinators raised before the event as well, where it kind of ties into it. Um, Wilf Maynell in the chat box said, there are a number of shareholders of the big developers who are also shareholders of the structural warranty providers that make mortgages happen. How do we get around this cronyism? And I think what this touches on is a, a feeling that there's like this kind of insurmountable um, thing and uh, an ACAN coordinator previously asked the question in a, in a different light um, saying it seems politicians only listen to their donors or sometimes marginal constituencies or demographics how can we get political purchase in a system that sometimes feels completely dysfunctional corrupt and indifferent I wonder if either of you wanted to speak to that um, I'm very happy to I, I don't I never take a penny from anybody <laughs> Um, so that's easy. Um, if people are getting donations, we would just avoid them like the plague, really. There are, a lot of, there are honest politicians out there. Um, you can find out who's sponsoring them. It's, um, it's not hard. You can look on them. Um, they work for you. Um, and um, yeah, um, I, yeah. I, I'm, I'm famous for actually bringing my own water to some meetings just to piss them off because I refuse to accept hospitality. People I don't trust. And I think that's one way. Um, just don't talk to people taking donations from, you know, from dodgy sources. Can I, can I, it, Shan. So, I think, I think there's a couple of points made as well about, um, I think it might be the same person, is it Wilf? <laughs> um, who was asking also about, you know, people who lobby for, um, sort of against accepting natural materials when they're, you know, they're plastics are the ones that, 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 that they want to be the standard. Uh, and all of that kind of thing. And I, there are, I think, in 
my experience as a councillor um, and as an assembly member is that the the whole of the, um, the building sort of repair and refurbishment, and we're seeing so much of this coming out from the grandfather inquiry, but there's this big world that's quite difficult for, for, for sort of normal people to grasp. You know, these things are, there's big, big, massive contracts. There's so much money in it. Um, and a lot of it's quite commercially confidential. And if you do manage to get hold of any documents, they're quite hard to understand. There's a lot of, you know, um, you know technical terms in there. Um, and I think, you know, Emma's right that politicians um, need help from the campaigners in deciphering all of this and need help from the experts, the people who are the professionals to go, look, point at this point here. This is what is wrong here. Um, this is what needs to change. Because it, it, it turns, because of all this non-transparency because of all the technical terms because of the enormous stakes there are uh, and because of a lot of things like outsourcing and, and all of that it's turned into a bit of a racket because you know if you provide fertile ground for and i don't want to slander anybody but if you provide fertile ground for essentially you know backhanders jobs to mates corruption it, that sort of thing will grow and and that's what we've ended up with in this whole area i think um and it bothers me and I've, I've i've hit brick walls through trying to work on estate generation schemes that are, that are clearly wrong and then trying to expose how they're wrong has been so hard and the same goes for things to do with um refurbishments and installation schemes and things like that not renfell other other ones this is it's very very common and i think you know the more we can all work together to to break this open make it legible show the problems the, the more we're likely to to generate the outrage um and hope and help people to win Great, right, thank you. Um, you talked then a little bit about um, basically highlighting the issues that we care about and um, Emma, you, you spoke about this as well. Um, I wonder maybe just to put it simply as a question, what is the best way to drive issues up the parliamentary agenda? Maybe I'll go back over to Emma. For this. Yeah, um, there are lots of different ways of doing it, as I said, and I, I think, as I said, you have to have a route map but um, you and find your allies, but you have to keep on and on and on pushing because there are times when you're not going to get that Westminster Hall debate, whatever it is, and that, which is something fairly easy. But but if they do, you know that, that, that it's relatively easy to get a Westminster Hall debate, which is kind of mini mini debate if you like. It's not that in the House of Commons, relatively easy to get that. But if you are lucky enough to get your MP or your ally to speak on a specific issue, then you have to really monopolize it. You have to really make the most of it. You have to make sure that everybody knows that you have done that and it's huge. So that's one thing and you have to, you know, you get your allies within parliament, but also your allies outside. So uh, with Grenfell, I was talking a lot to the RIBA, the group who was working on the um, Grenfell task, uh, what do I call them, the Grenfell group anyway, with the RIBA. Um, and I was surprised to find the um, Wallace Street for Charter Surveyors who were doing some absolutely brilliant work. I thought, oh, Charter Surveyors, you know, they're just trying to whack up prices everywhere. But no, 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 there were some really good people there doing some really, really serious work and they're working on this gold, international gold standard, which was very impressive. Um, so it's finding those, those people within those organizations who are doing really good work. Um, there's an awful lot of, you know, you can get sucked into going to conferences where actually they're just jollies and you're not gonna get anywhere and that is very very frustrating but it, it's it's finding the good people finding the good people who will keep pushing things through um and um yeah but as i said if if it goes quiet you need you need that protest you need that direct action you need something something big um but whatever just keep on and on pushing because you never know in all the years of, of me campaigning and i first went on strike when i was 15 so i got a bit of a bit of a, Bit of experience there. Um, sometimes the, the things that you really don't think are going to work do. They actually work. You know, we actually managed to get school uniform abolished for the sixth form. Can you imagine? Um, in a convent, amazing. Uh, and you know, the, the things you just don't know what is going to work. So you had to keep trying and all work together, but have different people doing different things. You've got your climate, your direct action group, and the person who's really good at talking to MPs or whoever it may be and keep on and kind of snowball it. Just just don't ever give up because you might win on something that you really don't expect, 
you really don't need to work. We saved a college and a library and a youth club recently. And I honestly didn't think we were going to win any of them. But we did. We did through amazing other campaigners. So that's, um, yeah, that's just don't give up. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so we've got plenty more questions and we will come back to some more of them later on towards the end. Um, so there'll be a chance for Shan and Emma to respond to them, some of them a bit later on. But to try and get a bit uh, on track again, um, we're going to go to breakout rooms now. So we're going to have a 10 minute discussion in breakout rooms and you'll be randomly placed into breakout rooms of four or five people to say hello to each other and talk about a question that will be up on screen in a minute. Um, so make sure to introduce yourselves and remember to raise your hand if you want to make a point and make sure everyone in your group gets a chance to speak. Um, after 10 minutes you'll be automatically returned to the main room. Uh, on screen now you can see a couple of questions, uh, a couple of um, hand signals um, that we like to use in our meetings and I think on the next slide is the question for the breakout room. So touching on some of the themes we've talked about, should campaign aims be realistic or idealistic in their ambition and should the targets be systemic or incremental? So um, I think we're ready to go into breakout rooms. Hope the discussion was lively in the breakout rooms there. We're going to head straight into our next speakers now um, from the CEE Bill Alliance, the team behind the Climate and Ecological Bill, followed by Rachel Owens from ACAN, who is going to be presenting a campaign about embodied carbon, and then we'll have a final Q&A at the end there. So um, first we've got Nessie Matos and... Alex Bradbury from the CEE Bill Alliance. So Nessie is a core member of the Alliance and coordinated the curation and content of the CEE Bill on the expert advice of a set of distinguished scientists, economists, academics, and lawyers. She's now primarily coordinating their research and COP26 international working groups. And Alex is coordinating the grassroots team at the CEE Bill Alliance, and he's been part of Extinction Rebellion since April 2019, primarily as a member of the Citizens Assembly Working Group, where he's helped research and promote ideas about deliberative democracy. So I'll pass over to Nessie now. Thanks very much, Joe. Um, so I just have a, one minute, first of all, to, to go through the outline of the bill itself. So the CE bill is aligned to the best science to date on the dual climate and ecological crises. Um, it's premised on the Paris Agreement's most ambitious target, uh, where the world's um, signatories are, collect are pursuing the keeping the global temp average temperatures to below 1.5 Celsius um, compared to um, pre-industrial levels. Um, plus, the UN's call of alarm on nature, where they, are, they, they have uh, stated that there's an unprecedented decline in um, the foundations of the ecosystems and our, of our quality of life. Um, this, along with the UK, to commit to equitable measures uh, to address both of these crises. Um, in order to achieve this, the bill stipulates that there needs to be restoration on our ecosystems, including our our vital carbon sinks, safeguarding against damage to ecosystems along our global supply chains, accounting for all our greenhouse gas emissions emb embedded in all that we consume in the UK, and primarily by reducing our emissions at source. Um, and finally, the strategy to achieve these objectives um, will be through a tripartite mechanism of a citizens assembly with government uh, under the scrutiny of parliament. So I'll pass over to Alex. Yeah, hi, can you, can you hear me okay? So um, yeah, so I'm gonna talk about the origin story uh, of the CE bill, um, sort of begin that story. So basically um, in the summer of 2019, a campaign group called Power for People um, approached uh, Extinction Rebellion to uh, suggest turning XR's three demands into a parliamentary bill. 
Um, so to recap those three demands after declare, the sort of uh, ACAN's three demands uh, looked, looked interesting to see, see some similarities. Um, so it's to declare a climate and ecological emergency, to halt biodiversity loss and get net zero emissions uh, to, so it's get to net zero emissions by 2025, and then the Citizens' Assembly, uh, sort of the, the roadmap for how to do that. Um, so a small group of us got together and we basically did that. We put it into the form of parliamentary bill. And this was what Emma was saying earlier on, actually, about those two sides of pushing for your demands and bringing, bringing your cause into the public eye. This was kind of, um, this was kind of the, the, the pushing for the demands aspect of that. That's what made me think of it. While uh, Extinction Rebellion is very much about, is very much about sort of raising the alarm, this is kind of the, okay, and this is how we, this is how we do it in detail. You know, this is kind of like doing some, doing some homework. Um, so that Three Demands Bill um, campaign culminated in um, last year's general election. And there we had a, lo a bill lobbying network, so it's activists across the country, XR activists, um, lobbying their MP, going to hustings, doing actions, tweeting. And we ended up with 200 candidates, among which were, uh, among which were Emma, I, I've checked this before, um, uh, which translated into uh, 15 MPs. Um, and then over, back over to Nessie to tell the next part of the story. Okay, so well, after the general election, we, it was understood that the Three Demands Bill be had become defunct. Um, but in very, just after Christmas, really, I was speaking to Amy, who had been part of the Bill lo Lobby Network, the Three Demands Bill, and had a conversation with her about reframing the Three Demands Bill, starting over, if you like. Um, and uh, she had, uh, we had, we had, a, we convened a meeting with um, an ex-director of FOE, Charles Secret, um, Friends of the Earth, Power for the People, is Ron Bailey, and um, Mike, who was part of Surface Against Sewage, to discuss the potential of the bill and of a grassroots campaign. Very similar, but this is when we learned a lot more about the Big Ass campaign, which led eventually to the Climate Change Act of 2008. Um, this then, uh, after, before that, before during, before the elections, I had done a series of interviews with experts and I had made some contacts and um, we were able to start consulting with experts. Um, one, of the, one of the most distinguished, I suppose, would be Professor Tim Jackson, who um, works for CUSP and had the Zero Carbon Sooner paper, which was very, is very seminal and very influential to our bill. Um, and we had a meeting with him and then uh, Professor Kevin Anderson. We also had meetings with Professor Dave Golson, who's an expert in bumblebees, and with Dr. Charlie Gardner, an ecologist. And it was actually with the ecologists who wanted to, wanted to emphasize the need to create a bill that coupled equally climate with ecology and didn't separate, didn't silo them. So um, then we had further expert advice from uh, Dr. Yuri Rajuji, who is one of the lead authors on the uh, 1.5 IPCC report from the Grantham Institute. Um, lawyers came on board, Caroline Egan, and then we had also very early support from John Elkington from Valance, who um, wrote about um, a sustainable business, I believe in the 80s, and Professor Bill Maguire, who's Professor of uh, Geo, Geo uh, um, Geology and Climate Hazards at UCL. We also then had contacts with already Caroline Lucas, who agreed to table the bill, but we'd also had support from Andrew Sims, and Char along with Charles Secret and Caroline Lucas, all of whom had set up the Green New Deal group in 2007. Um, and then I'm going to pass on to Alex about the, the tabling in September. Yeah, so it was, it was tabled um, in, it's on September the 2nd by Caroline Lucas, uh, the CEE bill, and um, also at that point, um, Extinction Rebellion, basically through a bit of a coincidence, to be honest, uh, had the plan the September Rebellion and really took the CE bill as one of it, the, the sort of one of the main asks of that rebellion. And so there's a massive amount of momentum at that point. Um, so that kind of almost takes us up to where we are now. So we, at this point, we have 85 MPs. And back in the bill, we have five political parties backing it as parties. Um, and 
now we've kind of because it's sort of the, the profile has been raised quite a lot um and and we've got our foot in the door in parliament um the kind of the campaigns changed tack or sort of broadened so the phase that nessie was talking about was fleshing out the bill um and those first engagements with mps as well and now we've got two more strands which have come along so we've got broadening out the alliance um uh, so obviously it's super important that extinction rebellion kind of made this happen um not kind of did <laughs> um uh, and we wouldn't be where we are if that hadn't happened but we won't really get much further if we don't have other organizations getting behind us as well so that's really important we've got businesses like body shop um supporting it got ngos like greenpeace who have come out and support the ce bill um so that's one really important strand the third one is the grassroots side which is where i'm most involved um and this is where the campaign will succeed or fail basically and um it uh, because when it comes down to it this is based around a, a system of representative democracy and it's the mps will act on what the constituents say so when we're talking about grassroots grassroots we're really talking about constituents here so individual campaigns obviously writing to their mps but also uh, in all kinds of ways you know um building alliances holding events um and uh, and the kind of thing that Sean was talking about actually earlier on with um, the boiler scratch scheme she mentioned that was really interesting to hear. So these kinds of really broad, unlikely alliances, in a way, we want to get them as kind of as unlikely as possible because unlikely kind of means broad politically as well, right? So we're we talk we're not just talking about NGOs, we're talking about um, or environmental groups. We're also thinking, you know, trade unions or. Uh, the scout movement or you know the wi or all of these we really need um broad kind of um uh yeah broad-based societal support in order for, for this to this to get through um and yeah maybe i'm sort of sensing that we're I probably need to cut short slightly so uh, how we like how are we doing that centrally how are we supporting that so in our in our central team um our grassroots team is sort of like a networking hub and a knowledge hub. So uh, the networking aspect, for instance, we're having regular Zoom sessions every week now, which is a space for campaigns to come along and sort of feel a sense of the, the campaign, especially important uh, in the current situation. And um, and then, and, and, and various other sort of spaces that we're, we're sort of growing for people to interact with each other, you know, online. Um, and then also a knowledge hub, so obviously providing resources on our website and that kind of thing. Um, and then we're also, um, so that's kind of how we're supporting the whole, the whole campaign. Um, and then we're kind of taking a targeted approach to specific constituencies through uh, a CRF, a content map, um, uh, relationship, uh, what was it, customer relationship management system called Nation Builder, which basically so we can target particular constituencies. Um, so based on, for instance, if it's a marginal seat and or if the MP is a member of a uh, conservative environment network, for instance, or it's a vulnerable, particularly climate vulnerable. And then we're, we're providing, you know, uh, more workshops to those constituencies on building, building those alliances and uh, how to kind of engage with your MP, this kind of thing. Um, and I just wanted to come back to sort of loop it back to the conversation we just had in the breakout rooms in terms of like what sort of a uh, in terms of this this realism aspect and that I think in those conversations uh, with MPs I think there was this research that was done by Becky Willis about how um, you know that uh, that a lot of MPs obviously a very heterogeneous group but a lot of MPs really do understand the emergency to, to, to a degree and or maybe to even to a large degree but they don't feel necessarily that their constituents are asking them to act on it um, and that's where it, this this question of whether this is whether we're doing something realistic or not, um, is it's actually quite a malleable concept, I think. It's about what, what we really mean there is it is it politically realistic? And I think what this bill is, is it's it's realistic in the sense that it's in line with science. You know, it's realistic in the sense that it's uh, in line with the natural world. Um, and we need to change politics in order to make the bill politically realistic. You see what I mean? And that's that's where those conversations with MPs are so important, and that's where a wider conversation in society is also so important. So we want to do that, obviously, to promote the bill and also use the bill as a as a kind of platform for that kind of conversation to happen. Excellent, thank you, Alex and Nessie. And um, 
Yeah, I mean, I, I really think the bill's been tremendously successful to date. So well done for your work on that. 85 MPs supporting it is really great. And I should have said before I introduce you that ACAN have signed up to the Bill Alliance about a week ago. And um, so we're looking forward to being, being more part of that. Um, okay, I'm gonna go over to Rachel Owens now, who is the ACAN coordinator for the Embodied Carbon Group. And um, yeah, I mean, what to say about Rachel? She joined ACAN during lockdown and has just become a really integral part of the organization, coordinating that group and now working on this embodied carbon regulations campaign. So what Rachel's gonna do is give a little presentation of it and then we're gonna go back to all of our speakers tonight and um, go back into a Q&A uh, with this campaign as a kind of starting point. So I'll pass over to Rachel now. Thanks, Joe. Yeah, hi everyone. Um, as Joe said, I'm Rachel. Um, really enjoyed tonight so far, and I think we're already getting so much great advice for this piece that we're working on. So, I'll run through at the end. Uh, I'll run through it, and I've got some questions at the end as well. Um, so, for the last fifty years, um, the construction industry has been working to understand and lower operational energy of of buildings. Um, next slide, please. This has been largely driven by national regulation from when energy conservation measures were introduced to the Public Health Act in 1972 and to the Part L we know today. Huge steps have been taken to ensure that buildings in use have a lesser impact on the environment than they once did. However, we know that embodied carbon has been left behind and needs to be a key part of the conversation to reduce the impact of the built environment in line with our Climate Act targets and obligations. So embodied carbon emissions are the greenhouse gas emissions that come from building, maintaining and demolishing a building. This includes the extraction and manufacture of materials and products, transport of materials, assembly and construction, maintenance, repair and replacement and deconstruction and disposal. Embodied carbon emissions will account for about 70% of a new building's total lifetime emissions and whole life carbon is the combination of the building's embodied and operational carbon. So in this graph you can see here, the purple elements at the moment are not regulated. There's been so much fantastic research within the construction industry around embodied carbon, measurement, reporting and reduction methods, including policy recommendations to government, yet embodied carbon is still not widely regulated in the UK, although as Sean mentioned, the, the GLA has done some great work to start requiring referral schemes to measure and benchmark embodied carbon emissions. When we as a group began to discuss a campaign, we started to feel the need for a document that really speaks to policymakers, those outside of the construction sector, to clearly explain why embodied carbon matters, what legislation is required, and how regulation can be created and implemented. We wanted to demystify the idea of embodied carbon and outline a clear route forward specific to the UK context and informed by the research taking place to date. The industry now knows enough to begin the journey of understanding, measuring and lowering embodied carbon. And these processes will become more accurate as we grow our collective experience. We also know there's an overwhelming need for an open database of whole life carbon in building projects. The missing link is the legislation to support and enable these actions. We therefore set out to create a briefing titled The Case for Embodied Carbon Regulation. Our main aim of the campaign is that whole life carbon is required to be measured and lowered for all building and infrastructure, infrastructure projects through national building regulations. However, there are many scales and routes through which policy could be introduced, including the building regulations, national and local planning policy, British standards, public procurement rules and tax rules. But only the building regulations can capture all projects, no matter their location, scale or ownership. We're looking to suggest a number of policy opportunities applicable at national and local scales, including whole life cycle carbon caps for all new and refurbished buildings, prioritizing bio-based materials, introducing carbon limits for key materials, including concrete, requiring material efficient structural design, setting minimum rates for salvaged and reused and recycled materials, and prioritizing retrofit over demolition and new build. The briefing will also feature case studies from around the world in countries where embodied carbon regulation is already in place or is due to be introduced. This includes Finland, France, the Netherlands and some US states. 
Regulating and lowering embodied carbon will also trigger a range of additional benefits, such as encouraging the creation of green jobs, stimulating the UK timber industry, prioritising locally made materials, creating a thriving UK recycling industry, driving the circular economy, protecting natural resources and biodiversity and lowering air pollution levels, both here and in other countries. ACAM want to find a more engaging way to discuss embodied carbon with policymakers and would welcome an open discussion around the aspirations of the briefing and how to campaign for this. As policymakers, informers and lobbyists, what advice would you give us to make the briefing as effective as possible? What information would you want us to focus on and is there anything policymakers care about most when making decisions? Do you have any advice on how to engage people on what at first appears a very technical subject? We have one overarching aim, to campaign for embodied carbon to be introduced into the building regulations. However, a myriad of research has been done by others on alternative policy routes, and we think that it's right to consider and signpost these. How can we strike a balance between asking for systemic change while allowing the possibility of incremental change in the meantime? We'd like to open this up to discussion with all of our speakers. Thank you so much, Rachel. I will. Um... I'll pass over to Shan first, if she's still there, um, as you were talking about embodied carbon earlier. Oh, I'm so excited by this. Can we have a proper meeting, though? Because I haven't, I can't possibly say all the things I want to say. Um, so, yeah. yes, please. Um, who, was, <laughs> who was talking just then? <laughs> Rachel, yeah. yes, can we have a proper meeting? Um, this is amazing. I mean, this is like a toolbox that will just be so useful. I mean, I was saying in the breakout room that that policymakers need to be given the ideas you know that we're not sitting there all day writing policy that's i mean we call policymakers, but we just make decisions and when decisions are made we need to be able to to, to choose things that are, that are presented to us by people we trust and so you know the, you are the right people at the right time to produce this absolutely brilliant um there are a couple of gaps um so you've identified regulation and planning policy um what i learned as a transport campaigner was one of the biggest points at which a decision is made is the decision to fund something. Um, the, de the decision to invest is the one that, that is really hard to go back on. Um, as a road, I'm using a road metaphor all the way through this, but basically a road scheme gets the green light when it gets funded and then the planning policy, the planning process is, is just delay, delay, delay until eventually they force it through. Um, and, and as a road campaigner, well, you know, once it's got funding, you're really in trouble and you can, you can, all you can do is delay it until possibly somebody else takes over the reins of power and pulls the funding out again. Um, so I think we should be looking at those decisions as well. The, the, the way we got in London, we got a ballot policy for people who are facing de demolition of their estates. So they have to be balloted. And that we've got applied to the funding decisions by the mayor. We haven't managed to get into planning policy because sort of government planning policy won't allow it. The other, the other aspect that comes out of transport is um, appraisal and comparing options, because that's actually a requirement of um, the Treasury Green Book. Sorry, this is why we need to have a meeting, basically. Um, but basically, when, when the Treasury makes decisions on how to fund things, it uses a process of appraisal which compares um all the different impacts of, of, of doing nothing of doing option one of doing option two and for me this is what we need in housing we need the options of refit refurb and and not demolition compared with demolition on all these different aspects so you'd compare you'd use embodied carbon would go into that appraisal but so would for example the social impact because there's a there's a huge social impact of demolition and then rebuild compared with refurbishment you, you break up communities so i really want to see appraisal used um, and that would give you other allies to work with i.e the people who who are campaigning on social housing so yeah those are my thoughts on that but but basically just please yeah do this and this is a this is an amazing first start and and the gaps are not real gaps they can be filled in later it's amazing thank you shan um does anyone else want to speak to that um Maybe I'll go over to Emma. Yeah, thank you. Um, I agree with everything that Sean says, absolutely. Um, and you know, we have to somehow get get join join up the two sides of the, the people protesting outside their outside their homes because they don't want them demolished, even though they may be leaking because they haven't they have been deliberately uh, the, the process of managed decline, so people get fed up with their homes. 
um, we had to, to join them up with the people who actually understand um, all the technical stuff and the um, the appraisal process and so on that Sean was just talking about. And we had to somehow um, join them together. Otherwise, all we have is angry, upset people um, and and um, um, technical experts on the other side. We have to. We must join them together. And actually, some of it, I think, is language. I wonder if the the phrase "embodied carbon" is actually evocative enough. Maybe we need a whole new phrase for that. Maybe we need something else. We need to name it. Let's rename it. You know, um, I don't know whether or not I renamed "Manage to Climb," but I used it a lot when I was looking around at estates where I knew they were deliberately running them down so people would get fed up. And I wrote a blog about that. I don't know whether or not I was the first person to. But anyway, uh, many ten odd years back. Um, um, and it is a process. It's a deliberate process of managed decline. A lot of people use it about estates now. Um, um, and we, I think maybe maybe we need something, as I say, evocative to describe embodied calm, carbon because it doesn't immediately think, you know, what the hell is that? So that's, that's one thing, just to get it out there, just to get it out there so people know there's not a big gap then between between um, the architects in, who, are, who are academics and so on and doing all this brilliant research. Um, and the angry, upset people are going to lose their homes. Let's join them up a bit. Absolutely. Um, could I go over to either Nessie or Alex and just ask, um, from your experience of working for this organisation that's taken this idea from uh, a kind of, well, from an idea in the grassroots into something that's being discussed by and supported by a number of MPs, um, do you have any advice for what Rachel just presented or like, I don't know, what would you say would the next steps to a fledgling campaign be? Do you know, I think civil engagement, I was brought up in a, a council state actually, and it was an amazing community feeling. I was in the 70s, so things have changed a lot since then. Um, but it was, there was a real sense of community. And politically now we've moved to this point where we have local citizens assemblies which are an amazing sort of uh, hub where people across the you know societal the spectrum even if it's in a local or regional area will meet with professionals will meet with parliamentarians will be able to meet with you know the the and and with be able to actually share the local concerns so i think that's a great opportunity for structured learning and and and, and also empathy there's a sense of exchange of ideas and a sense of what it feels like to be say living in a concrete jungle for example or for example um there's another example that's not to do with citizens assembly but transition town I don't know if you, you know about these, but it's about the example of setting up um, just a, te a temporary vision of what your, your area could be like with a little bit more green space, with more kind of um, sort of a, um, eco-friendly environment. And I think that just caps captures the imagination because I think psychologically sometimes it's, a, it's much more important to get the... Um, an, an emotive sense rather than a very rational sense. I think the rational brain is is quite sort of sort of cold and objective. I think that's uh, maybe where I'm... Thanks, Nessie. Um, there was a question in the chat box for both of you, which was about rhetoric and messaging. And, and somebody asked, do you think the recent rhetoric from the government is diffusing the message of the CEU bill by by agreeing with this message, um, changing the target dates and spending. Um, so I thought I'd, it would be worth asking you, how do you maintain message? And uh, maybe Alex could speak to this. Uh, I can try, yeah. I don't like, I don't think that they're, it sounds like they were agreeing with the CE bill because I want to check that, <laughs> if that's the case. Um, but you mean that they're, they're diffusing it by kind of sort of green, Greenwashing, that's, that the, that's what's coming behind the picture. But um, in terms of messaging, I mean, we've just, it's, it's kind of pretty clear. The bill is really, it's quite simple, you know, in terms of the, the structure that Nessie presented earlier. So, you know, talking about um, aligning with the international agreements that we've agreed to, to you know, and talking about what I was talking about earlier, that this is, that this is in line with the science. And we need to, you know, uh, make, make this a reality. Um, so, 
yeah. And then I think also another thing, I'm not sure if Nessie went into this earlier, is, is, the, is, is that this is really making it clear that the bill is, is very much a, a framework um, rather than that we want to get into the detail of exactly all of the uh, ways in which we achieve achieve the, the overall objectives of the bill. So to get uh, to get to net zero, to um, hold the extinction of species and, and these things. So uh, that, I guess that's another part of the part of the message as well is, is the citizens assembly aspect that a couple of people are asking about in the chat as well. Yeah, I think that's a good point. Um, There's another question about the Committee for Climate Change's report. This was a question way back earlier on. Um, this, this huge report landed from them today uh, about our roadmap to, to net zero. Um, it contained a lot of information about different industries and different sectors. There was, there was a question about embodied carbon specifically from Julia Barfield. She said she had a brief look at the report and couldn't see anything about embodied carbon. Am I missing something? So I'll go to Shan. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it is there. It's all in the, um, it's all in sectors, the CCC um, trajectories and all of that. Um, and you'll find aspects of it within the manufacturing and constructing construction sector report of the, of the CCC. But it's really, you know, it isn't, it isn't foregrounded. That's, the, that's part of the point. Um, mainly they tack, they don't talk about reducing the amount of resources that we um, go through as much as decarbonizing the production of roughly the same amount of resources if that makes sense that's very much the emphasis that we we see from from all the advisors to government so you'll see in there there's a there's a phrase or two about um recycling materials on construction sites and reusing materials as opposed to deciding not to demolish things in the first place um so it's, it's a bit like we have with um with waste waste in general, waste policies in general, we don't have a target within, um, gov within legislation to reduce the arisings of waste. We just have targets to increase the proportion of recycling. And you can obviously, if you're a carbon nut like we are, you obviously can see there that you're, not, you're missing out on a whole load of carbon you could cut by simply reducing the amount of, of new things you produce, not just increasing the proportion of them that's recycled. So this is still a very, it's a serious blind spot in a lot of policy. And as a green, as a green, you know, philosophically, I would say, you know, it's the obsession with, with growth. The, the starting point here is we maintain the same amount of economic growth, the same amount of activity, um, and we just try and decarbonize that by degrees. Whereas actually doing things that reduce the amount we travel, the amount of new things we buy is a, is a very efficient way of decarbonizing. So that's, that's a philosophical difference between us and the establishment in general, including the Committee on Climate Change. Um, I'll just say that, um, interesting, we have a meeting, um, part of our team have a meeting with the Conservative Environment Network, and they're really interested in the donut economy. Um, and donut economics, sorry, and they're going to be meeting hopefully with Kate Rayworth. So I think there are some interested individuals definitely across the political spectrum. And uh, I think coming down to human values, they're very universal actually, ultimately, no matter what party you belong to, there are definitely universal truths that we want for our children. And I think that that's the part of humanity I can't lose hope you know so I think donut economics is great because it sneaks in reducing it sneaks in uh, reducing growth without really saying so it's very clever it's a very good model mental model of how to deal with it and that's actually really good to hear that the conservative environment network is taking it up because I had a little look at their website and they said they were all for free market solutions to the climate crisis which just made me cringe but um i think that about human values is probably a good note to wrap up on i think that's a very good point nessie there are human values that we all share and that's maybe what we should be talking about and we've gone a little bit over time so i'm just going to wrap up um so if you could bring up the yeah so um, the ACAN Circular Economy Group has got a number of events coming up 
next year. Uh, these are lunchtime events and it will be a nine part series addressing challenges and opportunities in applying circular economy principles at the end of each RIBA stage starting from stage zero through to stage seven. So you can see the first three up on screen here. So that's on the 14th of January with Duncan Baker Brown, 28th of January with Useful Projects and 11th of February with Van Kunsten. So our next open meeting doesn't have a set date yet, but I think it will be on the 13th of January, but keep an eye out for, for that. Um, what a great way to end the year. Thank you again to our fantastic speakers this evening. Sean Berry, Emma Denkoad, Nessie Matos, Alex Bradbury and Rachel Owens. And if you'd like to become part of ACAN, then we'd really love for you to join. You can join a working group uh, or get involved in a campaign. And you can do this by signing up to our mailing list on our website or joining our WhatsApp groups, which is where most of our conversation happens we'll send some links out after this and finally after our meetings we like to go to the pub and obviously that's not possible in reality right now so we go to the virtual pub which we call the bishop's arms and in the mail out from eventbrite you would have got a link to the bishop's arms which is another zoom call and um, if you click on that come into the pub it's bring your own i'm afraid we don't have anything on tap but there'll be plenty of discussion to compensate and it's nice to see everyone's faces so thanks again